politicians should be on social media because it's also their way of connecting with people. And they certainly have a right to free speech. So I don't think it was easy for Meta to, to decide whether Mr. Trump should be taken down or not. And we actually also touched upon in our decision that Trump should not be taken down because he was saying falsehoods about the election. We only said that it was right to take Mr. Trump down because he was inciting violence. Hello and welcome. Billions of posts from billions of users, political, social and financial power bigger than some nation states. So how do you oversee Facebook? That job falls to the relatively new Facebook Oversight Board, dubbed the social network's so-called Supreme Court. And my guest today is its co-chair, Hella Torning-Schmidt, who was Denmark's first female prime minister. She led the centre-left Social Democrats party in a coalition and held that post for four years until 2016. Now she's helping to oversee the tech titan, which operates under the parent company Meta and also owns WhatsApp and Instagram. So can it really be held to account, even by former world leaders, professors, charity bosses and Nobel laureates? At a time when the social network business can block a US president and as it tries to curb COVID misinformation, arguably it's a more important role than ever. Hello, Tony Schmidt. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, well, we'll get to that role shortly, but I wanted to just come to something which I find fascinating about you. You were 48 when you left the biggest job of your life. It's actually very interesting because I, th I think that us prime ministers, we become younger and younger. And that also means that we leave earlier. Uh, many former prime ministers, they actually yeah, died on the job. But we are a generation of politicians that came into politics quite early uh, and are also leaving quite early and that means that I was just before 50 uh, and had just to shake my head a bit and find out what's what's there for me for the rest of my working life uh, and was extremely uh, fortunate that I got in contact with Save the Children International here in, in London uh, and started talking to them because they needed a new CEO and uh, I took over that role and was so happy to start a new chapter with something so meaningful as working for children all over the world. Can you remember that the day after you ended being Prime Minister? I mean, did you just get your jogging bottoms on, your slippers, I mean, you slob about? What do you do? It is so weird to stop being Prime Minister. And I think there's nothing that compares to that. You, you just, your whole life changes. And I remember very clearly coming in, uh, hugging my chauffeurs and my, uh, the, the police that had been helping me all the way through, hug them goodbye outside my house, walked in, um, closed the door behind me, and quiet, just quiet. No one phones you, the office, the party, you're used to people connecting and talking to you all the time and stuff happening all the time. And it was just quiet. So I remember that quiet. It was a tristesse, not like a, a depression, but a little bit of a situation where you're not quite sure how you live in this life without all the buzz that was around you. Uh, but I watched Game of Thrones for... <laughs> For a month, I got For a our, month. Okay, no, no, not really. I got our bikes repaired so I could bike around Copenhagen. There were so many things I hadn't done on my bike or just walking around Copenhagen. That was my way of transitioning into just being a normal person again. So you mentioned about becoming the chief executive of uh, Save the Children International. That came to an end, and your next role, which is, as I was just saying in my introduction, such an important and pivotal moment to have such a role, is co-chair of this uh, Facebook yeah. Oversight Board. I just wanted to ask, first of all, who asked you to do it and why did you want to do it? Well, we all know that social media has come up as ha and has for a long, long time been very unregulated. And basically what we saw was that the ultimate decisions about what content stays up on social media or gets removed is taken by the social media comp companies themselves and ultimately Mark Zuckerberg. And somehow that doesn't feel right. Uh, we need probably more regulation on, on social media, but it also seemed a better way of doing it that Facebook was actually outsourcing to an independent body uh, how their content should be reviewed. And so, so basically the reason why I took on the role is because I consider the oversight board independent. 
Facebook has to listen to our decisions. They have to follow our decisions. And we also have this uh, opportunity to give them advice or recommendations of what they should do on social media. And that goes both for, for Facebook and for uh, Instagram. So unless we have been promised complete independence and that they would actually abide by our uh, decisions and follow our decisions, I would not have done it. So it's basically Facebook's leadership asking me to do this. Uh, and we look very, very carefully into whether this would be an institution that would be have that complete independence. Well, let's definitely come to the and test the independence yeah. in just a moment if we can. But are you comfortable with the amount of power Meta has overseeing Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I think social media has been too unregulated for too many years. And uh, obviously the oversight board is not dealing with everything Meta. There'll be uh, tax discussions and other discussions, uh, antitrust discussions that we are not dealing with. We're dealing with content. But there is absolutely no doubt that until we started our work, Meta was left too alone in terms of deciding on content, uh, whether content should stay up or get removed, making their own rules as they uh, went along. Uh, the transparency was missing, it still is. And that is why we need regulation and we need an oversight board. What do you say to those who are concerned that you are funded by Facebook to police Facebook? Well, Facebook cannot interfere in any of our decisions. They have to live with our decisions. When we decided on the case with, regarding Trump, for example, they had to follow our decisions. And I don't talk to, none of us talk to Facebook about how we should decide anything. So it's up to each and everyone to decide, do they think that's independence? I don't take any orders from Facebook. You don't take any orders, but you can't necessarily know what they're not telling you. And, no. and, and for the world, you know, the whistleblower, Frances yeah. Howden, came to people's attention. Yeah. She came and spoke aloud, for instance, about that high profile Facebook users got to follow different rules and receive special treatment. I mean, how can you trust Facebook? after that? Do you have to trust Facebook to tell you? What no, we have to find a retrust in Facebook after that, because, for example, on the cross checks that uh, Haugen was talking about, uh, there's no doubt that we didn't know enough about that, which we have criticized uh, uh, Meta for not telling us sufficiently clear about these cross checks. Also, when we asked about it, we didn't get sufficient answers. So, uh, so this is something we are going to follow up on. And I think just the fact we have existed for a little more than a year now has shed some light on the lack of transparency, uh, the cross checks, uh, the fact they don't talk about these things in public and other aspects of uh, the la lack of transparency with, with Meta. So I do think that... Were you annoyed when you saw what Francis had to say? Uh, I was, I, I, yeah, some of it, yes. I was annoyed when I found out that the cross checks that we had been asking Meta about, they had not given fulfilling answer to our questions. What do you mean cross-checks? Sorry. When you... Cross-checks is what they do with these high-profiled high individuals right. that has an account where there seem to be special uh, rules for high-profile individuals. And you hadn't been told about it. We that. had not been told about it. And when we asked in the context of the Trump case that we looked at, yes. they didn't give us a fulfilling answer, which we have criticized also publicly. So this, I think, actually underlines that you're right. We don't know what we don't know. Uh, but gradually, when Meta is forced to open up more to us and then also... But by a whistleblower. To, to the, yeah, but that's... Absolutely. But that's why it's good to have whistleblowers. But I also think our role here is to keep asking those questions. We've also asked Frances Haugen afterwards. We had interviews with her because we invited her so to talk. Spoken we have to spoken her. to her, yeah, and we are probably going to speak to her again. Uh, so we have spoken to her in the oversight board to get even more information. And we will continue to talk to anyone who's got anything to say about Meta that we think will help us in our work and learn from that and feed that back to, to but, Facebook. But knowing that you have been misled, I wouldn't call it misled. I think that's that's your word, not mine. Okay. Well, sorry. What would you? They didn't tell us the full the full picture. They didn't give us the full okay, picture of, of the knowing cross that you've been left in the dark yeah. over some things. Is that a better yeah. way of putting yeah, it? Yeah. It's, it's details. How do you then trust Facebook? Do you trust Facebook? I think Facebook should be much more transparent with the oversight board, but also with the general public, which is actually more important. And I believe that the work that I'm part of in the oversight board will have that but effect. But do, do you trust them? You're the co-chair of the board. Yeah, I, I trust Facebook that they give us the information that we're asking for. Uh, Even though they haven't? 
I don't think they were completely aware that they didn't, um, but, but that's a different question and we have criticised them for, for it and there will be other things in well, the why future. Do you, why do you think they left you in the dark? I don't know, you have to ask Meta that, but I think the most important, you asked me, do I trust Facebook? I trust Facebook generally, but that doesn't mean that they will, in this instance, but also further on down the line, there will be more areas where we will criticise Meta. Uh, we criticise Meta every time we take a decision on anything. We have already issued uh, more than 80 recommendations for, uh, for Meta and we will keep doing that. Uh, we push them hard on some of these issues. So I don't need to trust Meta completely. I need to trust that they give us the information and they answer our questions truthfully, which I do. But I think that that will actually result in Meta treating their users better and being more transparent in general. Should Mark Zuckerberg still be in charge? I think it would be very wrong of me as a co-chair of the Oversight Board to start having opinions about who leads Meta. So um, I will refrain from, from getting into that discussion. I will not do that uh, because I think it'll, it'll mix up what the role of the Oversight Board is, okay. which fair is no, to look at the content. Fair yeah. enough. I, I get that. I just wondered yeah. if, you, if you did have a view. I know you've got a lot of opinions. So yes, I I've got to, a lot of opinions. I wanted to ask. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you something people do have a huge yeah. opinion about. You mentioned it briefly, but I want to just get a little bit more into the detail. Uh, almost a year ago to the day, really, Facebook decided to suspend yeah. President Trump for sharing a video of his support to his supporters, some of his supporters for storming the Capitol. Um, you upheld that view, that decision to suspend him indefinitely, but not permanently, is that right? It was a very interesting uh, situation where Facebook had decided to, uh, now Meta had decided to remove Trump from the platforms based on the fact that he was inciting violence. And they asked us whether that was, the oversight board, whether that was the right decision. That was one of, not one of the decisions where user complaints, it was actually Meta asking the oversight board what we thought about this. And we agreed with Meta that, they, it, that it was okay to remove uh, Mr. Trump on the basis that he was inciting violence, but we disagreed with the sanction that Meta had given. So we asked them actually to go back and find a new sanction uh, for Mr. Trump. So it became more a case about uh, Meta and an arbitrary uh, sanction than it was about Mr. Trump. So it was sorting out the system as well as taking a view yes. on that. Yeah. I understand that, but some people did view that as anti-democratic. You know, 75 million people voted for him yeah. and Facebook is in this situation where it offers everybody the platform. Yeah. And I suppose, what would you say to those people who say he has a right to be on Facebook? The most positive thing about social media is that, and we forget that sometimes when we discuss social media, is that people have been given voice where they otherwise would not have a voice. Agency and so many people can actually gather, make groups, um, create demonstrations, be together on social media where before they didn't have a voice. So that's the most amazing thing about social media. And of course, politicians should be on social media because it's also their way of connecting mm. with people. Uh, and they have certainly have a right to free speech. So I don't think it was easy for Meta to, to decide whether Mr. Trump should be taken down or not. And we actually also touch upon in our decision that Trump should not be taken down because he was saying falsehoods about the elections, that he was not speaking uh, the truth about the election result. We only said that it was right to take Mr. Trump down because he was inciting violence. And within Facebook's own rules, you can't uh, incite violence. I've got the right to speak, but I don't have the right to speak if I'm actually inciting violence against you or anyone else. So that is where we have to draw a balance. And I th we thought that Meta did that the right place. Um, but of course, Mr. Trump has the right to be on, on Facebook and Instagram if he does not incite violence. When's he coming back then? I don't know. You have to ask Meta that. Is, is there a date? Uh, I, I don't know. They've, they've given him a... I think gave him two years or something like yes. that. So you have to ask Meta. We'll be back in time potentially for another run at the White House. We'll see. We'll that's see. up to Meta. We, we will yeah. see. Um, and then you'll look at it, of course. That's part of, the, of how it works as we're learning. Uh, is Facebook a platform or a publisher? Uh, it's a platform in my view. Because it sounds terribly like a publisher. Do you think? With, as an editor in the way you just described that view of, of Donald Trump. I don't think so because anyone who 
creates a platform where people can can be part of it. They have created some rules. So I do think it's, it's good they have the community standards. They're actually really good, the community standards that they have. The problem is that they're not always followed. Uh, but the community standards are, are good. Uh, but so you, but you said that decision, sorry to interrupt, but you said that decision about Donald Trump, just to go back to, to how you put it, was not made by the community. It was actually by Meta. It wasn't by you know users coming forward. So that to me, you know, as a journalist, brings to mind an editor sitting in a room saying, well, I don't, I don't think that's OK for us to publish. Yeah, but I, I don't... there's a key tension that has been about Facebook for a long time. And of course, if it admitted to being a publisher, it would be subject to very different rules. Yes. So you don't accept that characterization? I don't think uh, Meta is a publisher. Uh, I don't think they see themselves as a publisher. But and they I'm, are taking and responsibility And I would also question whether the they content. should... They are, which they should should do. And I think we also have to find a new way of seeing that. That's why there's no doubt we need regulation, very much like what we but have. You sound like editors, you're bored. You said you only look at content. I, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I can see I what you're saying. Yeah. Where does it tip over into not into being a platform and not being a publisher? What keeps you Well, I think we're well, we're well past the point where you can just be a platform because you have to have rules because otherwise it just goes crazy. You will have- You have to take responsibility for what's being published. More or less, yeah. You have to take some response, but doesn't that doesn't make you a publisher in the old uh, understanding of the word. But that's, and, isn't and, that Facebook or Meta having its cake and eating it? I don't think so. I think they are completely entitled to have uh, their standards for what they want for on their platform. Regulators are, of course, uh, entitled to now regulate the area. I think we also have to quite ask the question, do we want social media to be a publisher? No, but that's the whole point. A lot of people don't, which but, is why they want Donald Trump back on Facebook. Which I think is a fair point of view, but do we, uh, do we they want- They don't want Mark Zuckerberg do, as the editor But do we want social media to then be, you can put anything on it? But the laws haven't kept a pace. So if you look at the law governing this, the US law, um, this section 230, excuse me, uh, states social media companies shouldn't be responsible for information produced by someone else, which means a user can publish what they want and that Facebook isn't liable. So which is it? Do, you know, you, you sort of, Facebook is being liable sometimes and isn't other times. It's very confusing. But I think what you're asking is really underlining that we need regulation, but also underlining that you can't take social media which exist in all shapes and sizes in many different countries all over the world and squeeze it in to a regulation that was for uh, the previous, old, times. Yeah, pre previous and other centuries outlets. Do you come down on the side broadly, taking a step back, coming away from the detail, that social media is a force for good? I do actually. Uh, and I think we sometimes forget it because people are asking really, really harsh questions and demanding more transparency and, and criticizing meta and social media. And Twitter and other companies. And course. fairly so. But I think we sometimes forget, would we like to go back to a world where we didn't have social media, uh, where we couldn't connect with each other on, on WhatsApp, for example, or, or communicate with each other, get in contact with each other. And also being that when I was CEO of Save the Children International, I met so many people across the world in refugee camps and uh, women who want to organize, uh, labor organize, or organize for microbanking or whatever. And they could not do these things without being able to connect via social media. Black Lives Matter, Me Too movement, I could go on. Of course that would exist and there were movements be before social media. But when you weigh it up, I do think that social media is a force for good, but we're not there yet. I wonder, are you grateful you didn't grow up? With social media? Well, I think, no, I'm, I, I love my childhood and I like the simplicity of my childhood. I really did. But I also think when you look at young people today, I have two kids. Yes. Uh, we have two kids. They are 20, 25 and 22. Honestly, I think they're, they know more about the world. They're cleverer. They are better than we were. You know, we also have an individual responsibility as parents to bring our children up, but also children growing up to teach them how to be people in the world that we have now. So I don't, I think we must be very, very careful not to paint this in black and white and say everything was just better. I know that's not what you're no, doing. No, but everything was better in the old days because there's so many th good things, particularly for 
for for people more, perhaps more marginalized people in the rest of the world that being heard uh, that has come of social media and i i've met so many people who finally has a voice because yeah. of social media and we must be careful not only to judge this by the narrow lens in a western nordic world because social media is much much bigger than uh, that and also i mean just to say you know the the societal ills that come out on social media were not created by social no. media. It's a platform to see them in a different way as well. But I, I was just going to ask you about something else as we our time together sort of comes to an end. And it was about uh, joylessness and joy because some feel, taking it from the perspective I am, at the Western perspective, I recognise that that the internet certainly did used to be a bit more fun. You know, you could share some jokes. I mean, you still can, yeah. obviously. But, but people sort of allowed each other to, to say things a bit tongue in cheek, a bit sarcastic. And I was just looking back um, and you took a selfie when you were prime minister. Yeah. You know what I'm going to be yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but for everyone else. And um, you were at Nelson Mandela's memorial. You were a prime minister. And on one side was Barack Obama and on the other side was David Cameron. And if I was you, I'd also be thinking this is an interesting selfie in the days before social distancing. So you all crowd in, you have a selfie. And some said, you know, this is not what you should be doing at a memorial. And, and actually, you responded saying, you know, we're, we're people. We yeah. are people. Yeah. And it was a joyful occasion in many ways. It, it, was, a, it was a very joyful occasion. It, it was a memorial, but it was at a, at a, a sports stadium. Uh, and the South African, like, there was drums, there was music, there was singing. It was quite a, a joyous uh, moment and almost a celebration of, of, his life. of his life. Yeah, We sat in the corner, all the heads of states of government and... Uh, David Cameron sort of muscled in uh, or where I was sitting, which was uh, close to uh, Obama. We had a nice time. Everyone was laughing and uh, and I had not taken selfies at this stage. This was my first selfie ever. Your first ever. selfie yeah. was with and the president uh, and, of America. And I think that, and okay. the word actually came into the dictionary that year uh, because it became so famous. And I just thought, this is, this is where you take selfies. Uh, so I just learned to take selfies from my, my oldest daughter. It's quite an impressive first selfie it's in some It's quite good, ways. isn't it? Depending yeah. on your political it's, view. It's not very good. I'm the only one who looks, who looks good in that selfie is actually me. And uh, so, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's actually, uh, it was fun. But people did criticise it because they thought it wasn't serious. Uh, and it certainly wasn't serious. And it was, it was interesting to... Um, to see that we were just three people in the moment. I said, oh, well, let's go to try this. And it was like a new thing back then. It sounded like David Cameron really tried to get in, in that. You were just in. doing it with yeah. Barack Obama. Yeah. It was quite funny because Michelle Obama was just on the side, if yeah. I remember correctly, of the image that was taken of you taking it, yeah. looking, um, you know, not in the picture, just quite quite stern straight ahead. It was never published, the selfie, I don't think, was no, it? No, I've got it. It's on my phone. Have you, have you framed it? I have actually published. I wrote a book in... in no, I haven't framed it. <laughs> uh, I wrote a book um, in Denmark, in Danish, yes. uh, and uh, it is actually in there. So it's can, in that. It's in there. It's seen the light. Okay, yeah. I, hadn't, I hadn't seen that. But <laughs> I, I suppose just... Just really to get your take around that, which is that, you know, there's a lot of hate. People don't necessarily see politicians as people. And, mm. and I just wonder, now you're not one anymore. You're still married to one, but certainly you're not a, a world leader anymore. Do, do you think it's at our peril that we don't see our leaders as people? Yeah, I think it is. And I, I always just want people to calm down a little bit because we are all people and we have got a private life. I'm not talking about being soft on politicians and not criticising for them when they do things. And, and I've been criticized a lot and prime ministers being criticized a lot. So that happens. But maybe if we all calm down a little bit also on social media, we would just have, we would just be nicer. And I think the rule should be that we try to treat people on social media like we would talk to each other when we met. And people are very polite to each other when they meet, when they stand the queue together, when they take the tube, whatever. And perhaps we should try and take a little bit of that politeness into social media and uh, the world would actually be a better place. Hello, Tony Schmidt. Thank you very much. Thank you much. so much for having me. And thank you so much for being with us. Until we meet again, mask up, stay safe and goodbye.